So today in the Vantage Seminar, we're continuing with K3 surfaces. And today we're very happy to have Bianca Varai speaking on the Brouwer Group and the brouwer monin obstruction on K3 surfaces. And uh, Bianca, is it all right if we video this talk? Yes. And go ahead, thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and thank you have, for having me. And thank you to everybody in the audience for attending. Um, it's, I really like this seminar. I feel like there's so many friendly uh, people that I see in the audience and I'm happy to see even some people's video on. <laughs> if other people are willing to share, I would love to see even more of your faces. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about the Brower Group and the Brower Monin obstruction on K3 surfaces. Just before starting, I'd like to um, acknowledge that I currently live and work, well, even when I'm not working from home, <laughs> I also work on the traditional territories of the Duwamish and the Coast Salish people. And if you're interested in finding out um, what traditional territories you live and work on, you can go to this website, nativeland.ca, and it will show you. Okay. Another um, public service announcement. Uh, so it's the month of February. So in the US that's Black History Month um, and Mathematically Gifted and Black does this um, amazing series of profiles every day of the month. Today's is Nicole Michelle Joseph. Um, so if you haven't heard of this website, you should go and check it out. There's a lot of great things to see. Okay, let's dive into K3 services. So this whole series, the current series in Vantage, is looking at conjectures on K3 surfaces. So what does it mean for us to study K3 surfaces? Well, at the very least, we should know the definition. So we saw this before in Edgar's talk and Alessandra's talk that an algebra, so I'm only going to talk about algebraic K3 surfaces, but an algebraic K3 surface is a smooth proper surface with trivial irregularity and trivial canonical bundle. So with these certain properties. Okay, so that's uh, some nice words. <laughs> What's the next thing we maybe would wanna do is probably you wanna see some examples. So what are some possible um, K3 surfaces? So you can check that um, any quartic hypersurface in P3 is a K3. So for instance, uh, this uh, Fermat looking one, we can take a Coomer surface as well. So this showed up um, in uh, at least the first talk. So you take an abelian surface, you quotient by the plus minus one map. So you have this double cover, but that's singular. So we desingularize, that's what I mean by this tilde, desingularize, and then that is an example of a K3 surface. Maybe another one you can take is a degree, degree two K3. So sort of the smallest degree you can possibly get. And this is a double cover of P2 ramified along a sextic. Okay, so we have a definition. We have some examples, but if this is the first time you have seen K3 surfaces, probably this isn't making you feel like you really know them. Like, what does it mean to know a K3 surface? So if you were hanging out with one or in introducing, if two of them were meeting, like what would they say to each other? What would they tell each other about themselves? Like what other things do they want to know about each other? Okay, so that's what I wanna explore. Um, okay, some, something's a little off with this slide. See what's going on. Oh yeah, that looks better. That's what we're we're looking at now. So K3 services also can't meet at a party. They're gonna meet on Zoom, but they introduce each other. Okay, so Coomer and Cordic say hello, they tell each other their names, um, and then they try to get a conversation started. So why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? So what is this K3 service? What is Cordic going to tell Coomer about themselves? Like if we wanted to be BFFs with K3 services, which I don't know about you, but I think we all want to be, like what would we know about them? What should we say? 
Well, again, this might be a little harder. Like, what can you even ask about K3 services? Like, can they dance? Can they sing? Do they like to do those things? You know, let's go to something else that maybe we're more familiar with that there's at least been some previous Vantage series on um, that we might guess what they would say about each themselves. So let's pretend now that we have two elliptic curves meeting on Zoom, not K3 services. The elliptic curves are shy, so they would like to have their video camera off. They just have their profile picture. What are they gonna say to each other? Well, this one is a little bit easier because elliptic curves, before they were even meeting, say they're going on a blind date, before they're even meeting, they're going to look each other up on elliptic curve Facebook. So who can tell me what elliptic curve Facebook is? I can't be the only one that thinks about it this way. Yes, <laughs> LMFTV, <laughs> that's the elliptic curve Facebook page. That's where we go to find out everything about the elliptic curves before we're going to meet them in person. So we go to these pages, Okay, this looks a little bit small, but you can go to <laughs> LMFDB yourself and just pick two random elliptic curves. Um, and this is what LMFDB tells me. So there's a bunch of fun information that we could know about elliptic curves. We could ask about their invariance. So the conductor, the J invariant, their sato take group. This one is an elliptic curve over an extension of Q. So we can figure out it's number field, um, whether there's a model that's a global minimal model, we can look at all of these different things. But one of the things that I wanna focus on today is uh, the torsion. So the torsion I kind of think of as sort of your first love when you first start finding out about elliptic curves, it's like the the first thing that you try to compute or study or understand, and it leads to a lot of interesting um, other questions that you use as a jumping off point. So if, so let's talk about this a little bit more. So we're looking at the torsion on elliptic curves and I would argue, and I think you'll agree, that this is a fundamental attribute of an elliptic curve, particularly over a number field. I mean, there we have the mordell Bay theorem. Oh, great. Yes, I love it. I was thinking maybe that the friends were the isogeny, other curves in the isogeny classes, but it, I like this even broader definition of friends <laughs> for elliptic curves. Um, yeah, so by the mordell Bay theorem, we know that the rational points on an elliptic curve is a finally generated, generated abelian group. And of course, when mathematicians find out about that, there we know what you would know if you were BFFs with a finally generated abelian group. You would know its rank and you would know its torsion. And so a torsion is a thing that uh, very naturally comes up. It also is interesting because it uh, rigidifies the moduli problem. So the J line, we know that this is a coarse moduli space. And so that can lead to different problems. The fact that it's not fine and that each elliptic, you know, that you have non-trivial twists of elliptic curves that that can lead to problems. But we can rigidify this problem by looking at x1 of n. So there we don't just look at an elliptic curve, but we look at elliptic curve together with a point of order n. And then this for n sufficiently large, this is a, a fine moduli space. And studying these modular curves and the tower of modular curves is, again, fundamental in understanding the arithmetic of elliptic curves. 
And not only that, it's helpful or sometimes even necessary for computing other properties. So maybe um, not just, well, if you know the torsion, then you can figure out, or if you know the Galois representation, then you can figure out whether there are isogenous curves over your ground field, or um, it's helpful to, to help you compute the Selmer group. So computing the two Selmer group on an elliptic curve with full two torsion is much simpler than computing the two Selmer group on an arbitrary elliptic curve. And so it's interesting in its own right, and it also helps us understand further arithmetic. Okay, so this is something that we could want to know about if we met an elliptic curve on the street. How does this help us if we go back to our original question of what do we want to know about K3 surfaces? So torsion on an elliptic curve is a great object for all of these different reasons. And you could ask, because we've seen that K3 surfaces are a higher dimensional, one possible higher dimensional generalization of elliptic curves, you could ask, okay, what should the analogous thing be? What should I want to know about a K3 surfaces? K3 surface that would play a similar role to the torsion on an elliptic curve. And you immediately run into a huge problem, which is that the K3 surface, it's not a group. It's just a variety. And even saying torsion, <laughs> even defining the object, I'm using that the elliptic curve has a group structure. So it's not completely obvious what we should do uh, or what we should think of as an analog of the torsion on elliptic curve. Okay, so let's, let's think outside of the box a little bit. Well, if you remember to when you first learned about elliptic curves and then you saw that they have this group law where you uh, connect two points with a line and then you reflect it across the x-axis, assuming you have a nice model. Well, so that gives you a way, a binary operation to combine two points but it's actually very difficult to prove using that definition that it's a group operation because it's incredibly annoying to prove that that operation is associative. So actually what's happening is it's, I mean, the elliptic curve has the group operation, but really it's the Picard group that has the group operation. And then we just, okay, here I should have really written, this is an isomorphism. But um, we use the isomorphism to then transport the natural group operation on the Picard group and bring it back to the elliptic group. Okay, this is already a little bit better because now the Picard group is a group. So we could ask about the Picard group of a K3 surface. And as we saw a lot in the first talk, the Picard group of a K3 surface is a very interesting object. It can be difficult to compute its rank exactly. It can be difficult to compute its structure as a lattice. But one thing that we do know about it is that it has trivial torsion. So taking the torsion subgroup of the Picard group of a K3 surface is not that interesting. Okay, let's see what else we could do. Well, the Picard group I can think of in terms of uh, Zariski cohomology, and then I can use cohomology comparison theorems. I can also interpret that as a tall cohomology. Still, this is the same object. So for a K3 surface, it's not going to help me. But then one thing that I can notice is that this one, we're really looking at the middle cohomology of the elliptic curve and middle cohomology is, is a very interesting object in general. So maybe this one, we shouldn't really think of as a one, we should think of it as the dimension of E. And so when we generalize to another object, we should not only replace what we're taking the cohomology of, but we should change what cohomology group we're looking at. Okay, so now we get something that is not obviously trivial like we had at the beginning. So let's see where we can go from there. 
Okay, so what I'm saying is from an elliptic curve, interpreting the torsion on the elliptic curve as this cohomology object, then that tells me, okay, for a K3 surface, which is two dimensional, I should look at H2, X with coefficients in GM, the torsion, and that is also known as the Brouwer group. Okay, for most of the talk, really probably all the talk, <laughs> it's completely fine to just think of the Brouwer group as a generalization of the torsion on the elliptic curve. That's really how I want you to think of it, and that's sort of what I will try to drill home over and over again. But in case you want another flavor or further understanding of what the Brouwer group is, I'll just try to say, give some sense of what this group is doing if you haven't seen it before. Okay, if you have any field, then the Brouwer group of the field is um, classifying so very Brouwer varieties over that field. So it's classifying varieties that geometrically look like projective space up to isomorphism over F. So this isomorphism is over F. Okay, so the two torsion um, is generated by the class of conics. Okay, uh, I guess from this description, it's not so clear what the group operation is, um, but that's okay. We'll come back to that later. Just it is an object which is classifying Severi Brower varieties and it does have a group structure. And you can kind of think of it as for a field, it's giving you some measure. of how prevalent norm elements are. So it's, it's kind of measuring the complexity of different field extensions, but also how many norm elements there are. So the Brouwer group of R, so there's only one finite extension, there's C, but not everything can be a norm from C. We have to have it, the element has to be positive to be a norm from C. So that's like a very meta suggestion of why it should be Z mod two, not even close to a proof. On the other hand, if you look at the Brouwer group of a finite field, finite fields have infinitely many extensions, so one for every positive integer, but still everything is a norm. If you take any one of those extensions, any element can be obtained as a norm. So even though there are lots of extensions, because things like to be norms, there's no Brouwer, there's no interesting Brouwer group there. Okay, so it's it's measuring something about the complexity of the field, but it's a little bit hard to state. It's not, not uh, well, okay. I mean, I did state it, so maybe not hard to state, but hard to get a, <laughs> I don't know. It's it's an aloof object. It takes a long time to become friends with the Brouwer group. Okay, so how can we think about the Brouwer group of a variety? Well, we can look inside the Brouwer group of the function field. So that's telling us the very Brouwer varieties over the generic point of our variety. And then the Brouwer group of the variety is as long as X is smooth, sits inside of here as a subgroup, and it's the subgroup of so-called everywhere unramified elements. Okay, so what do I mean by this? So I'm just gonna give some examples, and again, this is just to give you sort of a flavor of what the Brouwer group is doing. Um, a really precise understanding is not necessary for the rest of the talk. Okay, so let's look over A2. And we'll just look at um, conic bundles. So if I have a conic over the generic point of A2, so that I can write, so I'll let my um, coordinates of A2 be X and Y.
Okay, so this is what a conic looks like. And so we can assume that F, G, and H are polynomials. And since we only care about this thing up to isomorphism over the generic fiber, I can absorb any square factors. So I can also assume that it's square free. Okay, but now you see that if F, G, and H are non-constant, or maybe even their product, it's non-constant, square free and relatively prime. Pairwise, relative. Yeah. Okay. If their product is non constant, then when you look over that, that divisor or some curve that vanishes on FG and H, this conic bundle, this smooth conic, is going to degenerate to lines. So it will no longer look like something that's geometrically isomorphic to projective space. And so this. Okay, let me call this, I don't know, C, F, G, H. So this thing is ramified and it's not in the image from the Brouwer group of A2 in the Brouwer group of the function field of A2. Okay, so this is an example of something that is that is ramified, so not everywhere unramified. Um, and okay, you could soup this up to an actual proof to show you that the Brouwer group of A2 is actually just the Brouwer group of the ground field. I could just take a conic over my ground field and then just take the constant conic over all of A2. That works, that gives me an everywhere unramified element, but those are the only classes. Okay, let's do another example. Okay, so I'm going to look at this open subset of a Chatelet surface. That's not so important what it's called, but just this thing. This one, the Brouwer group is bigger than just the Brouwer group of the ground field. And what can we do? Well, I can take the conic given by u squared plus v squared equals three minus x squared times w squared. This conic degenerates over three minus x squared. So it looks like I have the same problem before. But because of this equation, because this is a norm-like equation over the generic fiber, this tells me that this is actually isomorphic Maybe let's call it tilde. To this conic. And so depending on which neighborhood I want to extend over, I take one of these two conics and use it to spread it out. And so because I have these two different ways of writing it, this class is everywhere unramified. Okay, what I want you to take from this example is that the Brouwer group is encoding some kind of geometric complexity, but it's not the same kind of complexity that maybe we're used to seeing. It's not telling us about sort of like fundamental group or other things like that. It's sort of telling us whether there are sort of hidden norm relations in our our class that we can use to sort of rewrite these algebras and extend. Okay. That's not exactly right, but it's, I feel like close enough for the talk. So it's, it's the Brouwer group is some, some object, some group, which is telling us something about the arithmetic of the function field. And then when we look at the Brouwer group of the variety, it's telling us some geometric information about sort of whether things are the same up to norms in the, in the function field. Okay, so that's, that's sort of my rough couple minute description of what the Brouwer group is. But as I said, for the most of this talk, you can just think of it as something, 
analogous um, to the torsion on the elliptic curve. So I just have to pause and give you one caveat, which is that I um, slightly swept some things under the rug. And if we look at the torsion on the elliptic curve, one thing that we see is because we have an underlying variety, because we're looking at the K points on a variety, that's the same as the Galois invariant K bar points. So I could go back two or three slides and instead of doing the whole analogy with E of K tor, the torsion on E of K, I could do the Galois invariant torsion on E of K bar. And uh, if I went through that analogy, then I would, what I would get is Brouwer X bar fixed by Galois. And those are not the same. So on the elliptic curve side, the analogy gives you the same thing. On the Brouwer group side, it gives you two different objects. OK, so then you're allowed to ask, we have this one object going to two different ones. Which one is the one that we care about? Which one is the important one? And the answer is, as they say on the internet, it's both. <laughs> both of them are important and interesting. I'm usually I'll just write like whichever one is faster for me to write. <laughs> um, if you want to know and spiritually everything that I'm going to say is going to be true for for both of them. But if you want to ask me about the details, then you can go ahead. OK. OK, so now we have this one object on the elliptic curve side going to these Brouwer objects um, on the K3 surface side. And we can ask, how reasonable is this analogy? So let's go back to what I said was great about torsion on elliptic curve and see if we can instead ask about it for a K3 surface. Well, um, OK, so I'm just going to tell you this is also a fundamental ad attribute of a, uh, I guess I don't need the X, of a K3 surface. Actually, of any smooth projective surface, the Brouwer group is a birational invariant of smooth projective surfaces. And so it has been used to give examples or actually smooth projective varieties. Has been used to give examples of varieties that are um, unirational but not rational because they have non-trivial Brouwer group. So, okay, I'm just going to say that that's true. Maybe if you haven't seen Brouwer groups before, you don't believe me, but I think there's lots of people in the audience that would back me up. <laughs> on this. Um, in, so on the elliptic curve side, we saw that torsion can rigidify the moduli problem. Well, so I don't know if, um, I haven't looked at the details enough to know that it definitely rigidifies the moduli problem, but I feel confident in saying at least that it enriches the moduli problem, that there are moduli spaces at the moduli of pairs x comma alpha, where x is a K3 and alpha is a Brouwer class of order n. OK, and this comes a lot up a lot in um, the study of derived categories. Um, but you can also use these moduli spaces to actually study the Brouwer classes on their own. and. OK, a lot of people have studied this, so there's too many names for me to list in this tiny little space that I've given myself here. But uh, it's including some people on the call. So just who I see at the top of my head, I see Asher Owl and uh, Tony Verily Alvarado. And probably if I could look <laughs> more slowly at the list of participants, I would find other people to add to that list. OK, so this is good. And the Brower group is also helpful 
for computing other properties or attributes. Um, and this is actually where my first interest in the Brouwer group came from. And so there's something called the brouwer monin obstruction, which I'll touch on at the very end of the talk. And it's useful for helping figure out whether there are, well, whether there's an obstruction to the existence of rational points on K3 surfaces. Okay, so, okay, I rigged the game a little bit because it was my talk, so I picked my list of properties for the torsion of, of elliptic curves, but I think they're pretty good properties and they also all carry over. Okay, so now I hope I've convinced you this is a reasonable analogy um, in terms of what we can get out of these objects. Now let's look at their structure. So, well, first let's see what happens over an algebraically closed field. Well, in the torsion, we know, well, over C, I can think of it as C mod a lattice, and the torsion I just get is Q mod Z, a quantity squared. Oh, I should say throughout, I'm just gonna work with characteristic zero implicitly, so I don't have to avoid saying like what's happening at the P torsion. Um, again, if you want to know, feel free to ask, but, uh, I'm, I'm, everything I'm stating is for characteristic zero fields. Okay, what happens for the Brouwer group of a K3 service? Well, using singular cohomology, you can see that this is also a power of Q mod Z, but it's no longer always the same power. It depends, um, it depends, uh, it depends on the Picard rank. This is the rank of the Picard group of your surface. And I guess because I said I'm working over characteristic zero fields, I should really have a 20 there. Okay, so it's, it's some power of Q mod C, but you already see that it's a little bit more complicated here already than what happens on the elliptic curve side. Okay, well, Over finite fields, well, what happens? Well, we have a variety over a finite field. So of course there's only finitely many points. <laughs> that one's very, even if I even if I don't have the torsion, I get finitely many points. But also when I impose torsion, <laughs> I get finitely many points. So for K3 surface, it's also true that it's finite, but this is much, much harder. There's no longer a variety lurking in the background. So this is, um, uh, basically follows from the Tate conjecture. Uh, well, okay, does follow from the Tate conjecture for K3 surfaces, and this is proved um, due to well, Tate, and then more recently to get everything in full generality, we have Francois Charles, Davesh Malik, and Kirti Matapusi Para. So this is not one paper with all of them, but a series of papers. Okay, so it's, it's we still have the same structure, but it gets much, much com more complicated to say what's going on. Okay, now what about favorite fields of number theorists over number fields? Well, the torsion on elliptic curve, we also know that that's finite. So we can get it from the mordell Day theorem, but also, um, we uh, have something simpler. So the points over a number field inject into something over any completion. And then away from, if we have good reduction, if we look at the torsion that's prime to the characteristic of the residue field, then we get an injection. And then we reduce to our previous case that we have finally many points there. Okay, what happens for a K3? Well, we also get finite with a little bit of an asterisk. So I just have to say 
sort of been agnostic about which one of our analogies that we were taking. So I just need to be a little bit more precise about what's happening here. So the Brouwer group of X maps to the Brouwer X bar fixed by Galois. And then the kernel of this map is called Brouwer one. So by definition, this is just the kernel of, of the map. Okay, and this map has a finite co-kernel by Kolichelin and Skorbogatov in 2013. Oh, sorry, I see, okay, I don't know whose name it is, but I, yes, I had the wrong, felt like that looked wrong when I had my notes, but, okay, so let me, well, okay, just read the chat and I won't go back a slide so that uh, I want to, um, I should have cited Nygaard and Nygaard Ogus in, um, in the previous slide, but then we still need Charles Mollick and Matapusi Para to get the full generality to include the super singular case. Okay, so, okay, so from, so the finiteness of Brouwer X versus the finiteness of Brouwer X bar fixed by Galois is basically the same up to this Brouwer one. So now we have to understand what's happening for Brouwer one. And um, well, what is inside of the Brouwer group we always have, if you think back to the example, we have some elements from the Brouwer group of the function field, of Brouwer group of the ground field living inside of there. So I always have Brouwer group of K mapping to Brouwer one and the kernel of this map is finite. So the image of Brouwer K to Brouwer X, which is called Brouwer zero, this is infinite. For a number of fields. Okay, so I can't say Brouwer group of X is finite because I already know I have this big infinite subgroup sitting inside of there. But what I can say and what is true and it's proved by Skorbogatov and Zarin is that the quotient Brouwer X mod Brouwer zero, that that is finite. And then by what I said on the other slide, that's the same, that gives me the same information of Brouwer X bar fixed by Galois being finite. Um, so Skorbogatov and Zarin actually proved also that Brouwer X bar fixed by Galois is finite. The Kolchelen Skorbogatov result that I mentioned didn't come until after then, and that their result, Colts Lens Garbogacha result is true in broader generality. That's okay. But those of you who are fans of elliptic curves in the audience know that we can actually say something much stronger than that. The, um, torsion on the elliptic curve is finite over a number of fields, we can say that it's uniformly bounded. So we have this theorem of Morel, which tells us that the torsion on the elliptic curve is bounded depending only on the degree of the number field. So not just we know that it's finite, we have some very strong restrictions on how large it can be.
Okay, so we can ask whether that same strong property holds for K3 surfaces, whether the size of the Brouwer group is uniformly bounded, maybe depending only on the um, degree of the number field. And this was conjectured by uh, Anthony Verily Alvarado in 2015. So it looks a little different and I'll talk that, about that in a minute. Okay, so it looks like it's a uniform bound. The only difference is that there's this extra constraint about fixing this lattice, and then we're only looking at K3 services with this lattice. There is a conjecture of Shafarevich that says actually only finitely many lattices can appear over any bounded number field. So if you throw in Shafarevich conjecture, you can remove the lattices and it will look exactly like the analog of Morel's theorem. Just putting in the lattices just gives you some clarity that it's like, okay. Even without assuming Shafarevich, maybe we have this uniform bound. Okay, so if we want to prove something or we hope that something is true for all K3 surfaces, then we need to have some understanding of what the space of K3 surfaces looks like. So if you look at the moduli, again, of algebraic K3 surfaces, the whole thing is an infinite countable union of 19 dimensional varieties. I don't know about you, I don't usually like dealing with infinite countable unions, um, at least not for varieties. So what you can do is you can pull out irreducible components by rigidifying with this lattice. So this maybe also gives some justification for what is happening um, on the previous slide. Okay, maybe you, don't, you know, if you have an infinite union, Right, yes, like CM elliptic curves, but 19 dimensions higher. Um, so, but if you pick out one component, then maybe we're uniformly bounded on that one component. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And so, suffice it to say, this is a lot more complicated than the moduli of elliptic curves, where we just have nice F on line. Who knew how good we had it? So now let's go back. So we now what the space looks like. So if we want to prove that the Brouwer group is uniformly bounded, or we hope to get some understanding of it. Yeah, it's true, but it, <laughs> okay, I'm just replying to Noam's comment in the chat that the J line is a very special case of what's happening, but still it, so it is sitting inside there, but the general picture feels much more complicated. <laughs> okay, so if we wanna prove something is bounded, well, sort of the elementary school idea of the ordering of the numbers when you know, you're know you trying to just think of a bigger number is that the numbers are just ordered marching along and we just wanna chop it off there and show we don't get any bigger. But as arithmetically minded people, I think we all have a very different picture in our head of how the numbers are ordered and we order them by divisibility. Okay, so we have them sitting up in this tower that's infinitely tall and infinitely wide and it gets complicated. I stopped drawing all the lines as you see and all the numbers, but they fit together like this. And so then when we're trying to show something is bounded, there's really sort of two ways that we can stratify it. So first, we can chop it off at the top. So we wanna show that the l -adic valuation of the number is bounded for every L. And then, ooh, then we chop it off vertically. So we show that the maximum prime dividing the number is bounded. And those are like the two arithmetic ingredients that we think of as proving uniform boundedness. And usually bounding the valuation, the maximum valuation is easier because we have, we can work locally. There's more local tools to figure it out. And that is indeed what happens with um, uniform bounds of the Brouwer group. 
So we know that the L primary torsion is uniformly bounded in a few different cases. So in joint work with Anthony Varley Alvarado, him and I proved that if you have a K3 surface that geometrically looks like the Coomer of an elliptic curve and an isogenous elliptic curve, uh, but where the elliptic curves are non-CM. So in this case, you have that the rank of the Picard group is 19. So we just have a one parameter family of curves. And so then we give a bound that depends on the degree of the number field and um, the size of the C. The size of the C um, should also be bounded, um, but that's not proved over every number field. So it's not proved that that is bounded depending on the degree of the number field. So just put that in as an extra constant to be safe. Okay, so I've put publication dates here. So, um, but this is in my rough memory of when I heard about the problem. <laughs> I heard about the results, so it doesn't actually match up. More jet. You can also, bound the L prime part when you have any one parameter family of K3 surfaces. So if you have a one dimensional base, so say some curve and you just have a family of K3 surfaces parametrized by that, then in that family, the L primary part of the Brouwer group is uniformly bounded, but the bound depends on the family. So it is possible that if you have a string of families, this doesn't rule out that it could become arbitrarily large after that. Um, it's also uniformly bounded. The L primary part is uniformly bounded when X is any K3 service of what's called CM type. So this includes things that, um, like I have in the first line, but where I remove, where I put E is CM instead of E non-CM, but it's also more general than that. So you can have lower Picard rank um, show up here this one is very interesting. So actually, this result, they bound the whole Brouwer group, not just the L primary part. And the way they do this is they actually first show that there's only finitely many geometric isomorphism types. over any number field, or maybe over any field of bounded degree, over any K. And then what they show is that if two, if you look at all twists of any K3 surface, so if you look at all K3s defined over a number field that are geometrically isomorphic, that their Brouwer groups are uniformly bounded depending on the geometric isomorphism type. And then because there's only finitely many, you can just take the max over all of them. Okay, so this, so we have in, this is, well, kind of one dimensional. So it's a one dimensional geometric family, but then we have twists, which maybe you think of as adding another dimension, but it's an arithmetic dimension. This is definitely one dimensional family and this is really zero dimensional geometric families. So we have a number of results when the Brouwer group is uniformly bounded, but this is very far from the dimension working across the whole dimension of the moduli space of K3s. There we know we have 19 dimensional families. And right now, all of our results only work in geometric one-dimensional families. So I'm not sure what the right answer should be. So one, one remaining very interesting question is, is the Brouwer group uniformly bounded? Forget about across all K3s. Let's just look at a geometric two-dimensional family, a 
of K3 surfaces. Is it uniformly bounded there? And I'm not sure what we should think because yes, we have Morel's theorem, but elliptic curves have one dimensional moduli. So is that evidence that it should always be uniformly bounded or is that evidence that it should be uniformly bounded in a one dimensional family? I don't know. Probably it's just that our techniques are only better in one dimensional families. That's, if you made me guess, that's what I would guess, but it, it is, um, yeah, still wide open. Okay, and the last like few minutes of the talk, I'd like to switch a little bit and talk about how we can use the Brower group for arithmetic applications. So as I said, the Brouwer group gives an obstruction called the brouwer monon obstruction. And Skor Bogachev conjectured in 2009 that this brouwer monon obstruction, so this object is called the brouwer monon set, brouwer monon, that it completely controls the existence of rational points on a, on a K3 surface. Okay, so if we could compute this brouwer monon set, then we could understand rational points on K3 surfaces. And Crash and Schinkel proved in 2011, this is more general than just K3 surfaces, uh, it's surfaces with particular properties that K3 surfaces satisfy. It says that this brouwer monon set is effectively computable if you have a bound on brouwer mod brouwer zero. Okay, so for an individual surface, we could just try to, we could try to directly compute what this Brouwer group is. We could try to compute a bound on it. And then we could try to run this uh, algorithm that's um, given. But computing the Brouwer group is really annoying. <laughs> so it would be nice if as much as possible, we could understand as much about the Brouwer group generally and the shape of it generally before trying to dive in to a particular object and understand what's happening. So before we had uniform boundedness results for the L primary part, but what if we no longer, so now the L primary part is no longer enough and not only do we want to just know that it's uniformly bounded, we want to know a bound on it. So we wanna know when the full Brouwer group is effectively uniformly bounded. And the last two results, so this, this result of um, or in score Bogatov, it does give you a bound on the full Brouwer group, but it's not an effective bound. So our, my result with Tony, gives an effective bound, assuming certain conjectures on, on Galois representations. But the last result, so for the particular CM K3 surfaces um, that were of the form that I mentioned, sort of the Coomers of products, but where the uh, curve is um, CM, then a recent paper of Balistrieri, Johnson, and Newton gives an effective bound in this case. But the bounds are very large. So assuming GRH, uh, Balistrieri, Johnson, and Newton get an improvement on their bound that we don't, Tony and I don't have in our paper. So maybe that's good enough to be in reach. And it is better if you look at bounds on L primary parts of the Brouwer group, um, because there's some numbers that can be shrunk by divisibility, um, but still they're pretty big. So, so we probably don't have a good enough bound on the Brouwer group in general to really be able to run this algorithm without doing any extra work. Okay, so what we could ask is whether we can determine sort of in advance 
So before computing the Brower Monon obstruction, do we have a way of knowing which Brower classes should play a role in the obstruction? So what do I mean by this? Well, what is the Brower Monon set? So what you can think of is that there's a pairing from the set of adelic points with the Brower group of X to Q mod Z and the K rational points under this pairing all go to zero. So you think of each element of the Brouwer group of X as cutting out some subset. So you can think of, you want the adelic points orthogonal to this Brouwer class. Um, and the elements in Brouwer zero they also go to zero. They give no condition on the obstruction. So it's really elements of Brouwer X mod Brouwer zero. And we want to, if, if you have an obstruction, then because of um, topological properties of this pairing, there exists a finite subset that accounts for it. So you can ask whether we can understand, like, are there some conditions that the Brouwer classes have to satisfy in order to possibly obstruct? And I think maybe the first suggestion that something like this might be possible was a result of Iranamu and Skorbogatov in 2015, where they observed that if you have any diagonal quartic, the odd, the elements of odd order in the Brouwer group never obstruct any rational points. Okay, and there's a lot of twos that show up for K3 surfaces. So then you're like, oh, maybe, maybe this is true more generally. Okay, I'm running short on time, so I'll just yeah, phrase this question. So um, one thing you can maybe ask is, okay, can we tell just by the order of the Brouwer classes that if you have an obstruction, it already just comes from the D primary part. And something even stronger would be, okay, if you have an obstruction coming from any subset of the Brouwer group and you detect the obstruction from that D primary part of that subgroup. So like this would really tell you the elements of order prime to D cannot obstruct and elements of order D that, that they're the only ones that ever play a role. And for Coomer K3 surfaces, the answer is yes, that we get this very strong property and it holds for D equals two. So in joint work with um, Brendan Kreutz, we proved that the two primary subgroup if you have an obstruction, it can be detected only from the two primary classes. And these preprints came out sort of within months of each other. I think Skorbogatov and Zarin's uh, came first. Um, so they showed that the odd order classes can never obstruct on a Kuma K3 surface. And then using so these two results, Skorba got to have realized that the techniques could be combined to throw, show this very strong case that if you have any obstruction that from any subgroup, then it must be detected using the two primary elements of that subgroup. Okay, and so now I will just, and there's similar statements that are true for more general varieties, just maybe not more general K3 surfaces. And there's also a paper of Nakahara Wait, what was that? What was that notation again? Two perp. Oh, two perp. That means the odd classes. So the classes of order prime to two. <laughs> yeah. So this is the same as Brouwer odd. And in the last statement, B is. Oh, that's sorry. This should be due to the infinity. The subgroup? This, sorry. Oh. That should. Oh, have been. I, okay. That's okay. Good. Okay. That's I thought I got them all, but the <laughs> second to last slide we have have it. Um, okay, 
But so what about K3s in general? So this is the question I ask. And so the question is phrased for, is there a D? But maybe for Coomer K3s, you think that the ants, you should ask this question for D equals two. But for D equals two, we know that it's false in general. So I'll just list all the results and end here. Um, so these are a series of results showing that the two primary construction on K3s, two primary obstruction on K3s is not enough in general. So yeah, I'm at the same, same case for uniform boundedness that now I'm not sure what to believe anymore. Is it that we just have the wrong D? The definition of the D gets more complicated when you move away from Coomer's or is it that general K3s are just, it, the property about Coomer's is really just about Coomer's, not about K3s. And I don't know, I'd love if one of you guys could tell me. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Bianca. Well, this would be a great time for questions. Um, okay, so see Asher asked in the chat, if the torsion points on elliptic curve are analogous to the Brouwer group of a K3 surface, what are the infinite order points analogous to? Um, and I don't know. I mean, well, you probably know. I could run my analogy without even having the torsion, and then it just gives you everything in the Brouwer group. Um, but it doesn't feel... Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> it would be fun to figure that out. I have a question. Um, is there an analog of isogeny for our K3 surfaces? Uh, there's a, an analog in the air. <laughs> Um, but I don't know that it's been written down. Uh, I don't know. If, um, so I think the suggestion is that case free surfaces should be isogenous if there is um, a maybe surjective map between their lattices with finite kernel. Mm. It's, it should be coming from a morphism of the lattices or maybe an inclusion of the lattices. Forget which way we want it to go. I mean, isogeny of elliptic curves, of course we have it <laughs> both ways because we have the dual isogeny. Um, so maybe either direction is, is okay, but it's less, so that's maybe, um, if I talked more about the singular cohomology perspective of the Brouwer group, you really see the lattice coming into play and quotients of the lattice. They help give you these moduli spaces, these marked moduli spaces of K3 comma Brouwer class. Um, but I, it's definitely not as uh, fully developed as a theory as it is for elliptic curves. Oh, I did not know that. So Jeff is saying that the moduli spaces have HECA operators. I, yeah. Also, there's one question from Noam Elkies in the chat. Yeah, okay. So that is one, one thing that I wondered. So whether for the Brouwer group, you need to, so for Coomers, I mean, the lattice of a Coomer can be more complicated, but they are characterized by this Coomer lattice, which has discriminant two to the 16th. So that's like a lot of twos showing up there. And maybe that's what's leading to the two primary part. Um, I, so I think that's what no one puts in the chat that we wanna look at those dividing the discriminant of narrow and severity is what I would have thought but um, particularly this result of um, Berg and Verily Alvarado, because this, 
I think it's a degree two K3 service. Is that, that's right. Yeah, I see Jen nodding her head and it's got rank one. <laughs> so from the discriminant, we only get a two. Um, so it's in this case, we don't know if there are other two primary Brouwer classes that are causing an obstruction as well. But I would guess that with their construction, you can wiggle it enough so that there's no two primary classes. But I don't, I don't know that for sure. But that's, this is the one that makes me suspicious of that property. Wonderful. All right, well, let's um, thank Bianca again. This was a wonderful talk, and we're going to continue with uh, the K3 surface theme on March 9th with Francesca Balistrieri talking about zero cycles on products of K3 surfaces and Coomer varieties. So thanks so much again for coming, and see you in two weeks. <laughs>